Have you ever saw a company that you loved and just wished you were the owner of that company? Or maybe you aspire to join the ranks of the other private equity carnivores that acquire companies and turn them around for eye-popping returns. Well, in this week's episode of Making Billions, I bring on my dear friend, Ryan Nadell. Ryan is an acquisitions expert, and he's going to reveal his secrets on how to acquire a company. You're going to want to listen all the way to the end where Ryan tells you how to get his entire system for free exclusively for our listeners. Buying companies and making massive profits are all skills we can use in our pursuit of making billions. Here we go. Welcome to another episode of Making Billions. I'm your host, Ryan Miller, and today I have my dear friend, Ryan Nadell. Ryan is the CEO and an acquisitions expert at MIT45. His work will go on to produce an estimated $125 million in revenue this year, and it's only going higher. So what this means is Ryan understands how to locate, close, and operate companies in a way that produces world-class operations that also produces life-changing profits for him and his investors. So Ryan, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for having me, Ryan. Really appreciate it. Yeah, it's good to have you. You know, I've, uh, we've gotten to know each other a little bit offline here and, uh, I'm so impressed with the work that you've done and everything that you've produced, but, uh, you know, so it's easy to, to figure out who you are today, but I'm curious, where did all of this begin for you? Ryan, I was born with that that golden spoon in my mouth. Not even silver. It was better than that. No, I'm I'm absolutely kidding, right? I came I came from pretty pretty humble upbringings. Right? I, I graduated with a, a mechanical engineering degree. I, I literally, because math and science were simple to me, jumped into that field fully knowing I didn't like sitting behind a computer, didn't love AutoCAD and all this stuff. But it was path of least resistance. And so, of course, the logical step to me post graduation is to jump into the illustrious world of used car sales. I literally jumped in and became a used car salesman. But that that belly to belly interaction taught me so much about, you know, human behavior, human psychology, how to sell, how to position. And it didn't take long for me to start um, really taking over a dealership. Took over as ended up being a general sales manager, then moving to a luxury brand here in, here in Columbus, Ohio, and had a great time. But started looking around, and it's like, okay, I'm making good money. But I'm working 80, 85 hours a week, and I'm making the dealer principal incredibly wealthy, but I don't have any equity, and I can't get any equity. So I'm, I'm going to slide my, my chair back from the desk. I'm going to step out on a ledge and jump into a startup web hosting company. And the, I didn't know anything about web hosting. I didn't understand technology. I'm a sales guy, right? And I came in as a sales guy, officially an affiliate manager. But as the tides kind of roll in and roll out, it took me about four months, maybe it was five, to take over as president and CEO. We hit this great moment in, in the market where we were able to just outposition our competitors. And that allowed us to go from 10,000 clients when I came on board to about 600,000 clients two and a half years later. But in that interim, right, two capital raises, one of them was a necessity. We were burning through cash incredibly quickly as we attempted to get into the foreign market of Brazil, right? Low cost of acquisition. I wasn't qualified. Right? I'm a 27, maybe 28 year old young man. And I'm like, oh, International commerce is just like domestic commerce, right? Business is business. It's the same everywhere. Well, by the time the dust settles in Brazil, we're out about four and a half million bucks in hard cash, plus about six months of things that didn't go the right way. And so our backs are against the wall. And like, you know, we've had enough. My partners and I want to sell it off. And talk about lessons, right? And whole other things to share at another point in time. But we didn't know finance. We didn't know accounting. We didn't know accrual-based accounting. I can go through this, this litany of things that we think this $48 million year revenue company is going to sell for hundreds of millions of dollars. But by the time the dust settles, it was under 10, right? There was almost nothing there. And so nonetheless, at 29 years old, I, I think I'm the second coming of King Midas, right? Everything I touch turns to gold. I have to have everything figured out because, you know, here I am, had sold in the car world, had helped grow this web hosting company. And I'm like, I'm going to start a high-risk merchant processing company. And if you're unfamiliar with what that looks like, anytime someone swipes a credit card, whether it's physically or online, you enter your credit card information, there's this intermediary step that takes, you know, fractions of pennies to multiple pennies for the privilege of scanning that credit card. And so I said, look, inside the web hosting world, 
the merchant processors were always making money, so I'm just going to go do the same thing. It's a it's a surefire it's a surefire win. And so I'm like, I'm going to go for the most aggressive ways because high risk, high reward. So I'm going to I'm going to process payments for for gambling. I'm going to pr- process credit cards for adult traffic, all the things that are really, really, really obscure. Well, I'm, my head's down. I'm a sales and marketing guy. I hadn't spent any time studying finance or accounting. I spent very little time studying ops. And I look up 18 months later, it's December 21st, and I am walking to the office to terminate my staff. And it wasn't because, right, it was, oh, I need to start over. It was because the bank account was at zero. And not only was a bank account at zero, my personal bank account was at zero simultaneously. So all the money from the exit, Ryan, it was all gone uh, about 18, maybe 20 months later. And I'd love to share that it was, you know, this divine intervention, but it, it wasn't. You know, at the moment it went went flat broke. When I say flat broke, it's I think there's different versions of that. My truck was repossessed, my two rental properties were in foreclosure. If I look at my net worth back then, I'd probably say it was negative 40, maybe sixty thousand dollars. It was it was not sunshine or roses. And so I want to point my finger at everybody else, right? It's logical. It's, it's the market. It's my staff didn't pay attention. These people screwed me over. But what it really was, what it really still is, is right. My ego was so big. I was absolutely convinced I didn't need somebody to help me. I was convinced that I could maximize my own, my own returns by not having a, a, a C-suite of powerful, successful people to support me. I had great staff. But the staff was more entry level. They were more listening to me than guiding me or providing some sort of guidance with me. And so there was no team around me. There was no support. And here I am in, in shambles, right? There's, there's nothing left. So, of course, I say the logical thing to do is to get into what I refer to as hand-to-hand combat. And no, I didn't become a cage fighter. I'm not in the UFC. None of that stuff happened. What I did do is I wanted to get into sales again because I knew I could defer back to that, right? We had that great conversation off air of like, what do you do when everything goes away, right? You, 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 look, at, you look at the remnants of what's left and you figure out, okay, what, what sort of scraps can I pull from this to, to go to the market? And I knew I could sell. I just didn't have a product or service to sell at that point. And so as God or luck or divine intervention would have it, my wife who's now my wife, she was my, my girlfriend at the time, her brother was getting married and I needed a custom suit for the wedding. So here I am again, this broke guy, there's no money left, right? I don't have anything left. I'm charging it to put it, you know, put it on a credit card, but my physical stature, I couldn't walk into a normal clothing store to buy a suit. And so I get a custom suit made and I completely front in this moment. And I'm talking to the clothier about, hey, this seems like a really interesting career. I just went through an exit. I'm looking for something else to do. Would you mind teaching me this craft? Right. And of course, I'm saying because I haven't reconciled that ego side yet. Right. It's still so big that I, I probably carried around a sawzall with me to cut through door frames. Like I, I couldn't I couldn't actually make make hide or, head or tails of things. And so, of course, he taught me the business and incredibly thankful for that. But Columbus, Ohio, isn't a Mecca for custom clothing. You know, people are conservative in the Midwest. So I had clients in New York City. I had clients in Chicago. I had clients in Southern Cal- or Southern Kentucky. But I didn't have any money to get to them. And so I'm literally waking up 2.30 in the morning in this tan 98 Cadillac sedan DeVille with a nice tan leather bench seat, tape player, it burnt oil, had a couple hundred thousand miles on it. And I'd get up and I'd drive from Columbus to New York City. It's about a nine hour drive, assuming no traffic. And I'd, I'd suit people all day long. I'd take their measurements. I'd show them the wool. They'd pick out their suits. And then I'd drive back as far as I possibly could make it before I literally couldn't pry my eyes open, you know, the window down, chugging Red Bull air conditioning blasting, and I'm still falling asleep. So I pull over and I sleep in rest stops or in, in, you know, empty parking lots because I just didn't have the money to pay for a hotel. And I did that for quite a, quite a period of time, but I was noticing as I was going through this, it was just inefficient. It wasn't scalable, right? I mean, just logic is I'm a one man band and I'm doing well, but I have to keep traveling back and forth. And so I reached out to some of the old developers from my web hosting company and said, Hey, could you help design an app? Where if I took pictures of somebody's body and we had measurements that we could cross-reference those two together, come up with a standard deviation between the two, allow them to pick out wool and essentially order custom-made suits, as long as I had their measurements, custom-made suits from anywhere in the country at any time, and that those orders would automatically go to the fulfillment house. And it took six months, but it worked. And it worked really, really well. But Ryan, as it, as it worked so well, I brought it to the owner of the company I was working for. And I said, hey, look at this great, shiny new object that I built. This is amazing. 
And he looks me dead in the eye and said, that's great. We don't need that in this industry. We need pens and paper. We're not going to use it. And I'm sitting there scratching my head around. I'm like, I, I literally, I don't even want anything for this. This is just, you know, thank you so much for what you've done for me. So I go out on my own. I'm in my own, own lane now, start my own business. And right, that, that entrepreneurial side kicks back in. I'm starting to get a little more confidence. I say, look, I've got some great connections in the wool side of the world. I'm going to reach out to a wool manufacturer and have a conversation of, look, how about I give you this app in exchange for a small piece of equity inside, inside your wool factory? And as luck would have it, you know, he'd be the third Ryan on the call. His name is Ryan. And he said, you know, I think it's a brilliant idea because he understood that this app was a conduit to help understand sales throughput on his side and shorten down, you know, the, the cash conversion cycle. So he was incredibly excited. Still at this point, Ryan, I think the apps, you know, between two and three, two and three thousand active users right now on, on platform. So it's in the app store if you ever wanted it. What's it called? It's called the Huddersfield Textile App, right? Okay. Super, super good branding, right? I mean, it's it's go. good for the wool, wool manufacturing. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm stepping back and I'm saying, okay, now I've got a team. I built some sales staff. The sales staff is doing well, but I'm still traveling. I'm not home with my family. I, I'm, I'm going to slide my chips to the middle of the table and I'm going to cash out. And I actually did an owner finance deal to my head of sales, empowered him to take over the business. And it worked mildly well until it didn't. Right, it wasn't a huge multi seven figure exit. I think he made it another ten months before running to the ground, and there was nothing left. But right, that's all right because in that amount of time, I went out and started a CBD business. It was 2016, and the world didn't know what CBD was quite like they do today in 2022. And so I'm telling my parents, like, look, I've, I think I've struck gold here. Right, I, I figured out how to market CBD online. I'm generating tons of, of traffic and tons of sales. And they say, well, do you have a good attorney? I say, well. Not, I mean, I have an okay business attorney. Why do you ask? I says, no, 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 criminal attorney. You're selling drugs online. You're, you're going to go to jail. I'm like, no, 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 no. So there's a whole educational curve back then. And that, that business lasted for the next two years where December of 2018 sold to a private equity group out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, right? They needed it for some strategic, strategic growth initiatives on their side. And as I do this, Ryan, now I've got some people socially that have seen I proof positive, at least in their mind, that I know how to sell a business, right? I've, I've sold the web hosting company. I've sold the, the clothing company. I've sold the CBD company. Now, admittedly, in my mind, how I understand business acquisitions and, and liquidity events now, I didn't know anything. But at that moment, friends and people in the fray thought I had something up my sleeve that was beneficial to them. So I said, hey, logically, I'm going to start consulting with people. Right, I, I do know how to grow and scale a business. I feel confident in my skills. So I, I start this consulting business. And it just so happens that you know the first 15 or 20 clients I work with all eventually wanted to sell their business. Now, these weren't multi, you know, nine-figure exits. They were, you know, solo shops, maybe maybe small companies, five to ten million in annualized revenue, decent margins. But I was able to help them avoid the pitfalls that sometimes come into you know getting a company ready for exit because I'd made so many of those mistakes. And so I look around and, you know, a year and a half passes and there's 11 or 12 companies that have sold. And I'm saying, boy, this is great. All these companies have sold. I've been a consultant. I'm not consulting for equity at this point. I'm just literally riding along consulting, you know, poking around inside the business. I say, this is wonderful that I've helped all these people, you know, increase their net worth. But I've left a lot of meat on the bone, right? I haven't increased my net worth almost at all. And so I, I reach back out to him and I say, hey, if, I think we've got a formula here. I think I know how to do this. Would you be interested in you know a, a capital pledge if I were to create a, a, a private equity fund? And quite a few people said yes. So I've got this little fund over on the side now that exists. It's, it's you know tons of dry powder in it right now. But during one of the during one of those consulting conversations, it led to a company called MIT Forty Five, and MIT Forty Five is this kratom company in two thousand fall of two thousand eighteen that did five million in annualized revenue. Now I didn't know what kratom was. I'd never heard of it before. Probably much like you, right? It's, well, what is Kratom? So I start poking around and doing research and find out that Kratom is this leaf that is regional to the Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia quadrant of the world. And we take small amounts of it, potentially gives you energy, take large amounts of it. You know, maybe it's a, a muscle relaxing, more of a sedative, but it's got some gray around it too, right? The FDA doesn't like it because it, it works on an opioid receptor chain and there's some, some different nuance to it. So I'm like, yeah, if nothing more, I can consult with the business. It's no big deal. Well, as we start consulting, 
Ryan, we, we fast forward. I eventually take over as COO because the business starts scaling. And then they bring me in as partner. And then I go from partner and COO to CEO. And now I call it managing partner where, gosh, just last year in 2022, we did just under 70 million in revenue with about a 41% net profit margin. And this year, looking at the trajectory going forward with some strategic acquisitions, some, some different variables to go on that way. I'm absolutely convinced if the first two months of this year or any are indicative of what the future success will be, we'll do in between 120 and 130 million in annualized revenue in 2023. And and all debt, all, all equity still in house, right? It's it's still myself and two partners. Man, that's a smoking deal. And what a phenomenal story. Thank you for sharing that. So, you know, it, it, as you were speaking, I thought of the the very famous quote from Nelson Mandela. I'm probably gonna butcher it, but he says, I never lose. I either win or I learn. And you've done that for so many years. And isn't that the entrepreneur journey? is you're just winning and learning nonstop. And then eventually all that winning and learning that you've done all comes to critical mass. You achieve escape velocity and you hit blast off, brother. So, and now you're at mid 45 and you're running these things. Um, and it's, it's a private equity fund. And, um, so you focus on, I'm assuming like strategic acquisitions in your fund um, are you looking for acquisitions or anything right now? I am right inside of mid 45 being this, this Kratom company. Yep. It's a fractionalized market right now where, whether it's, you know, vertical integration, whether it's su- supply chain in, in raw materials or whether it's current competitors, we're fortunate to be one of the larger in the space, which of course gives us that gravitas of when we, we reach out to somebody on a cold reach out, we at least get an answer back on the other side. It's like, hold on, you know, the, the Coca-Cola, if you will, of the Kratom space is interesting to have a conversation with me. I got to at least hear out what they have to say. Man, that's that's phenomenal. So we're looking for deals. Um, I think you mentioned like distribution channels, other small businesses, as long as they're uh, somewhat related to the Kratom uh, ecosystem as well. So, I'm, yeah, I'm just curious, like um, for those of us around there who, uh, that are crazy like you and I, we're, we're deal junkies. Um can you talk about a deal that you've done uh, for that and just kind of walk us through a little bit of the, just open the kimono a little bit. Tell us how did that go? And Yeah, ab- absolutely. I mean, Ryan, normally I'd keep this pretty close to the vest, but I think with the relationship that you and I have had so far and the, and the fact of you asking so kindly, I'd love to pull back a little bit of this. And this will be one of the first times I've shared these details of how this works inside this industry. Making billions exclusive. Here we go. It, it is. It is. So, you know, we started looking in 2022 of how to keep growing market share. And right, and to me, there's only a couple ways to grow a business. Grab grab new clients, sell current clients more stuff, or sell them stuff more frequently. The fourth component, of course, is go out and buy somebody that's doing the same. And so we started looking and seeing what's out there. And there's not a lot of market in the Kratom space, right? There's not, you can't hop with a business broker. You can't look on a listing site online. There's not, oh yeah, there's 12 Kratom companies over in the Northeast Quadrant you can buy. That doesn't exist right now. So I started doing cold outreach to people that had never thought about selling their Kratom company before. And we reached out to a company called Golden Monk Kratom, right? And, and Golden Monk specializes in direct-to-consumer commerce, where MIP45 at that point, Ryan, was almost exclusively B2B, right? We did $54 million last year in just B2B revenue, right? Distribution channels exclusively. And so Golden Monk exists, and it said, gosh, they're an SEO-based company. They've been around two and a half or three years. They're doing 12 to 14 million in annualized revenue. I think it's a natural fit. And so reach out and start having conversations. Now, the seller, he's never sold a business before. He's never considered selling a business before. He has no idea how to value his company, but he's at least willing to entertain a conversation. And to me, that's so much of anything, right? It's just, can you can you open the door for the conversation to see what's possible? And so, And so through this process, right, it takes us, gosh, the better part of nine months to conclude this deal. And when I say conclude the deal, right, it's it's funny, you'll appreciate this, Ryan. And I'd love to share this if you're okay with it as we keep going deeper. But I'm asking, you know, we we put out the letter of intent and I'm saying, okay, look, now I need a data room. And the seller's like, well, what's a data room? I said, well, you know, I'll I'll, I'll walk you through what I'm looking for. It's it's fine. So put out the request of information. It's literally 150 things I'm looking for. And he responds back with, I don't have any of these. I might have three. And I'm like, oh, okay. And so 
to, to reconcile the accounting side, right? Which is so, so important to me, right? The quality of earnings, the merchant recs, the bank recs, kind of across the board. He gives me essentially the download of the bank account transactions for the past two years. He gives me an Excel spreadsheet and he gives me a download of the merchant processing statements for the past two years and said, here's my financials. And that's really how the whole, whole process started. We eventually get it across the finish line, right? It's a combination of, of cash on the bulkhead and, and an owner finance deal over a long enough period of time. It takes, like I said, more, more time than would be normal in a small market deal like this. But we buy it and we integrate it. And there's instant pickups in this because as I'm looking at this deal, because of the size and scope of MIP45, our net margins are, are healthy, right? Where some of our competitors don't have the buying strength that we have. And so just the quick value pickups, right? We're picking up a, you know, four or five points and driving down the cost of goods. I'm picking up two or three points in consolidation of, of effort, right? The labor forces. Now there were some redundancies. I'm picking up some additional consolidation in expense from, we have our own internal SEO team. We have our own process to run. And so all of a sudden, but right, I'm, I'm looking and the company that I bought for, you know, one in three times EBITDA, right? 1.75 times EBITDA for about 9 million bucks, right? The revenue in the past, you know, nine, 10 months r- ramps up from 12 million to about 16 million. The net, net margin, right? Increases back to that almost the same as mid 45, right? That 40, 41% up from, you know, the mid twenties. And now the valuation just logically, right? Because there's the arbitrage between the two, we get the power of being one of the larger in the space. So we've had some independent valuations done in our company, you know, somewhere between maybe 11 and 14 X multiple of EBITDA versus this pickup of one and three quarter time multiple of EBITDA. So you don't have to be a rocket scientist to say 16 million at 40%, right? It's, it's it's okay. It's, you know, 6.6.2, 6.4 million, you know, depending on the trends. Now it's worth 65 million or so. So, you know, grabbing an asset for 9 million, now it's worth in the mid sixties. It's a good day's work. Holy cow. So 9 million to 65 so that's like 350 percent return on investment hell yeah so so here is a perfect example thank you for sharing that that make you billions exclusive this is really good so i want our, our listeners around the world to who's listening to ryan adele number one who never gave up right he decided i'm not going to be invincible i'm going to be unstoppable and there's a big difference and ryan certainly uh, illustrated how that plays out. But number two is the power of investing in the private market, not just investing, but also just working in it and being an, a founder, a funder. I mean, everybody's, uh, wh- whatever side of the aisle, maybe you're both, whatever side of the aisle someone finds himself on, that 350, 360% return or increase, everybody experiences that. And so this is why making billions is all about private markets, venture capital, private equity, entrepreneurship, and everything in between. And so all of those things that you've 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 uh, walked through and, and showcased are absolutely phenomenal. But I do need to ask you this. So from all of your experience, and it is very vast and you've done amazing things, I'm wondering if you can give just a few pieces of advice that, because you didn't have you when you started, but you got you now. And so that advice that you would have given to your younger self or anybody else uh, who's looking at this space and just says, man, what a cool story. I see myself in Ryan's shoes. Um, Maybe he's figured out a few lessons. What are some of those pieces of advice that you can give our listeners around the world to help them? in this industry. Yeah, Ryan, I, I love the question and and I'm honored, right? I, what I'd love to do, if you're okay with it, is walk through kind of the structure of how to how easy it can be to make an unsolicited offer and how to structure that, right? Because to me, whether you're a current business owner, whether you aspire to be a business owner, whether you're a fund manager, whether you're launching, you're going to need deal flow across the board. And it's it's surprisingly simple right now. So, Ryan, are you okay if I share that? Kind of kind of get dive into that? Yeah. Excellent. Let's hear it. Excellent. So I call it just the unsolicited offer path, right? And, and I like to use a combination of tech and people to support this, right? So you don't have to have a big staff to do any of these things. You can literally do it as long as you have a computer or internet access, right? And for me, it all starts with, with a software called SEM Rush. And what that does is it allows you to, to type in domains and see comparable companies, comparable links, like whether it's, whether it's backlinks into the, to the main company or competitors, it's really an analyzation platform to understand digital, the digital landscape. 
And so again, if it worked very well for me because I was looking for a digital asset, but gosh, even if you're a local market, you're a, a small market buyer, you're looking for a local HVAC company, you could still use SEM Rush to type in, you know, for me, Columbus, Ohio, HVAC, and you get the whole waterfall of what's out there. And so to me, it's it's great because on that side, then it becomes a little bit of a people process where, quite frankly, I don't know if you bought domains before, Ryan, I bought more than a, a couple in my lifetime. I pretty much always add domain privacy, right? I don't want everybody to see, see, see what I own. I like to be a, a little bit behind the veil. And so while I see these digital assets, I need some way to get a hold of the business owner. And it's typically not just from SEM Rush. So now I have to look at the contact us part of a website. As crazy as that sounds, that, that typically is an entry point into behind the front door of the organization. And I have a whole script and framework that, that is, what is that outreach? Instead of you know laboriously reading this, I'd love to offer this to, to your listeners if you're okay, Ryan. The entire framework, that the reach out from the emails to the, the phone scripts I'm going to go over to the legal letters I'm going to send. I'd love to offer that as a value add if you're okay with that. I would love that. Yeah. So uh, we'll we'll include some of the contact stuff of how people can get that in in the description uh, in the show notes, um, and then also feel free if you've got if you can say it verbally. Maybe it's complicated, but either way, um, yeah. Let's uh, let's include a way for people to get all all of your tools and your scripts and all the secret sauce. You're just giving it for exclusive for our listeners. Absolutely. I'm going to make it super simple. It's just ryanidell.com forward slash making billions. We'll, we'll make it really, really easy to get to it. So it'll be all the resources I cover. So if, when you find this interesting, don't worry about trying to scribble down all the notes. Just just ask for them. I'll just give you the playbook. Awesome. So Nidel with two Ds, N-I-D-D-E-L. So right from that point, I, we'll talk about the physical product space. There's a whole other hack there. So not only do you reach out to the actual contact us on the physical product space, Ryan, but then, of course, you should actually buy the product. Right, especially most products online, you're looking at somewhere between twenty and a hundred dollars. It's certainly worth the investment. And if it's a consumable good, on the label, it has to have an address of where it was manufactured. Now, quite often in this space, these individuals are using co-packers, co-manufacturers. So they don't own the manufacturing themselves, which comes into play here in a moment. But not only do you get the the address on the bottom of the label, but on your packing slip, it's probably gonna have a corporate address for the business. And there might be a return address on the box. So you're literally getting three different contact points in addition to the website. So one of those ends up always leading to something. And the next next part of that is I've got a lawyer, right? That's a general counsel inside of MIT 45. But you could do it with a local law firm if you get their approval for it. Where I have that local lawyer draft up a templated email or a templated letter on their letterhead that basically says, I have a very motivated client looking for your type of business in your space, in your market. He's paying you know, top dollar in the marketplace. If you're interested, please reach out to this phone number, this address. So now that letter gets sent to all three of those contact points because even if the co-packer gets it and they see that letter come across that says it's from a law firm and that it's addressed to the company itself, the manufacturer, Man, they don't want to open that. They don't want to touch that with a 10-foot pole because they don't know if it's it's something good or something bad. They just see a lawyer, and they're sliding away from the table. So it always gets me at least to the business owner. Now, none of it is, is some sort of game to play, right? It's only I'm not threatening anything through these letters. It's all very positive and intent. But as I go through this, now all of a sudden, I start getting access points into these potential sellers, but they don't know their potential sellers yet. And most people haven't sold a business before. And so it becomes this interesting play back and forth of walking them through what the process could look like, right? The lawyer just sets an appointment for me to hop on the phone. And so I'm sharing this information. I'm getting to know the seller who doesn't know he's a seller yet. Well, it's natural, right? Hold on. You've worked your entire life or at least the past six months, you know, probably multiple years to grow this business. You've never considered really selling it before. How do you do it? And so it's simultaneously providing them, you know, unbiased third party information, resources like your show, Ryan, resources that that exist online of here's what to expect when you go through a sales process. And one of those to me is offering up two separate independent valuation specialists that are accredited by the IRS saying, look, you don't have to take my word for this, that I'm, I'm willing to pay this multiple of EBITDA for your company. And of course, I already have some idea from the letter of intent, right? I know my buy box pretty well. But look, if if you're really interested, 
here's a bunch of contacts of people you could reach out to. Here's people that will run valuation cycles for you. You know, it's a three to five thousand dollar investment, depending on the complexity of your business. I, you don't have to take my word for it. And the craziest thing is to me, when you give and give and give, and you do it honestly and you do it with integrity, most people begin to trust you as I believe they should. Where now I can put out that LOI at a value based off of what I feel comfortable with. And until they get all the way to the finish line, they're probably not even considering ever speaking the valuation specialist. It probably doesn't actually matter to them. And so really to recap, Ryan, it's using social proof, right? Finding, finding businesses using something like Google, bouncing that into a tech platform called SEM Rush, using that to then contact, you know, navigating the web, send a contact us form out, you know, stating your intent, which I have the script for, using a lawyer to send a letter out as well sparking up a conversation from a very neutral place, right? You're not being a loan shark. You're just talking about what it is. I'm, I'm interested in buying businesses like yours. I'm really happy with what I see online. It looks like an incredible opportunity. Would you be interested? From there, offering tons of resource and value. Here's valuation specialist. Here's what to expect. Here's how it works. For me, because I've had a couple of transactions on my belt, I can even guide them towards people that I bought their businesses before. All right, so now it keeps getting easier and easier. Then all of a sudden, it's the letter of intent and then working through the due diligence process to, to get to a final close. Man, what a phenomenal way to just make an unsolicited offer because those are tough in this industry. And as, as you can hear, Ryan knows what he's doing. And so he's able to spark up interest. And like you said, I'm talking to the seller who doesn't know he's a seller yet, but I'm going to buy right back to your early days of, of uh, working on sales and, and being using those skills, right? You can see it all adds up. You win and you learn. So bringing all of the, that experience and now you can send that out. You have a script which you're generously uh, willing to provide um, and making those unsolicited offers. But one of the interesting things that I find, Ryan, is while it's good that you can make an unsolicited offer to any company, really, doesn't mean that's a company you have any business buying. So the ones that you, you said you know your buy box really well. So the ones that you do have, uh, you know, you really are interested, you know your buy box, I'm assuming there's a little bit of due diligence that goes in a little bit before and during and after. I'm curious, um, what is your due diligence process that you go through? Maybe you can summarize that on some of the key things that you look for when doing your due diligence. Yeah, ab absolutely, Ryan. Would love to. And, and due diligence to me can be this massive black hole the first couple of times you go through it. And even after <laughs> yeah. being through it more than a handful of times, it still can be a black hole, but it, it's how, it you, how you enter into it. And to me, so much of this starts with those pre-LOI conversations with the, with the seller, who again, doesn't know he or she is the seller. And I'm really asking questions to understand what I deem to be some of the vulnerabilities in the business, right? Because I believe in paying fair market value for a fairly ran company, right? I'm not looking to, to nickel and dime and, and whittle something down to zero, but I'm not, not looking to pay above market for something that's, that's not worth above market rates. And so from that, I'm asking questions around, right, walk me through, have your, have your financials been audited before by a third party? But I don't phrase it that way. It's typically, when's the last time your financials were audited by a third party? And they're like, uh, they never have been. Oh, it's no big deal. That's, that's no problem. Right. And then we start branching into, and if key personnel were to leave your business, how deep is your process documentation that someone could jump in right away and complete it an 80% efficiency? Well, I, I don't have all of them documented yet. Oh, that's no problem either. And so what I'm doing pre, pre LOI is I'm planting these small seeds of doubt because, right, we step onto the call and typically the seller, right, they think their company is worth potentially a lot more than it is, right? Because everybody's baby's the prettiest in my experience. And so I'm not trying to devalue it. I'm not trying to pick apart their company, but these are things that I look for during that due diligence cycle. And so based off these questions, then it starts to really turn into how am I phrasing the actual due diligence? So we're assuming the letter of intent has been signed. We're assuming there's, there's agreed two points on, on, on that deal sheet. And then it's going to start for me instantaneously. I need to do a digital deep dive. And that digital deep dive, I think, is so often overlooked with understanding really what's out there on the web for this person. And, and there's companies to do this. I'm not implying that, you know, you sit there and if, with Google for the next 12 days and, and try to figure out the nuances to it. I'm instantly getting a hold of somebody externally to do, you know, backlink checks and on-page SEO and, and reputation management research. And I'm looking for all those little breadcrumbs that could show 
that something's a little off. And I'm doing this without the seller really knowing it's happening, right? I, but as I get these findings, I'm making sure in those ongoing conversations that the seller knows that I'm seeing some things, but I'm doing it in a way that's not disparaging them, right? It's just very conversively. I like during the due diligence cycle, you know, at least bi-weekly status updates, sometimes even weekly status updates with the seller, especially if they haven't been through this before. They don't really know what I'm doing on my side. So I have to clue them, clue them into to what I'm experiencing. And so we're doing the, th- that digital asset deep dive. And then simultaneously, right, I'm always looking at a level of quality of earnings, right? I need to do the financial tie outs to understand, okay, they told me they did 10 million in revenue last year, but what does revenue even mean to this seller, right? Re- revenue, oddly enough, can mean different things to different people. And one of the, the great benefits, especially in the small market, is quite often these sellers don't understand the, the premise of ad backs to EBITDA. So quite often, you actually get a, a positive pickup as a buyer because they say their EBITDA is you know, 25%. And really, the ad backs is probably closer to 31 or 32. Right? That, that's okay. Right? That's a, a little cherry on the top for us as, as buyers. Right? And then, then I switch over to the SOPs because what I'm looking for at that point is, are those key personnel really key? Are they really vital? Because to me, Ryan, you, you've been through this more times than I'm sure I can count, right? You've got some people that are really excited about the possibility of someone hopping in the driver's seat and pressing the gas down, but you also have equally as many people that are, are nervous or apprehensive and, and don't really want to work for somebody new. And so what I'm looking to do is sure up those vulnerabilities before we even jump into it. And based off the, the SOPs or lack thereof, then I jump into key personnel interviews, right? So of course, I need to see an org chart. I need to see where people fit. I need to know how the business is structured. But those key personnel interviews become paramount. But there's there's some pre-work to those interviews. Right? One of them, we use something called predictive index. And I have to you know, go ahead and, and denote the fact of I'm not an investor in predictive index. I don't own shares in it. I, I didn't, I'm not a founder. It's, it's a tool that I use that is, is incredibly beneficial. Whether you're looking to buy companies or your own, your own companies, predictive index is this great assessment that helps you understand people's EQ. Right, helps you understand kind of what's going on behind their eyes and, and what some of their propensities are if left to their own devices. And what I found is if you're too many standard deviations away from the mean, they're probably not going to be a long-term cultural fit. The more standard deviations away, right, they're not only a good fit, but they can actually mask a lot of things. And so I use that as a referential point, and I use another tool called Criteria. And Criteria, again, not an investor, don't own it, didn't create it. But what Criteria does is allows us to assess someone's IQ and more, more rational EQ for the role that, they're, that they currently occupy. Because what I found so many times in this due diligence cycle, it's almost like I have this incredible project manager. I couldn't run my business without this person. And I run them through the assessments, and I see what they have going on. I'm like, this person couldn't be a janitor inside the company that, that's acquiring it, right? They're, they're just not, that while they're great for the business we're buying, they're not great for the new, the new merged company as a whole. And so this plays into, of course, that, that component of those key personnel interviews where eventually we get to just down to the brass tacks with those key personnel. And quite often, right, the, the first couple of times I did this, Ryan, I was bashful. I was apprehensive. I didn't want to upset somebody because, you know, I, I want to not upset the apple cart. But then I started really thinking, I have to protect investors or I have to protect my own money. And the best way to do that is just to, to flush out the objections right now. And so there's a, a question that I ask everybody before the interview ends. And that question, Ryan, ends up being, do you see yourself integrating into the culture that we have here, or do you like an off-ramp to go pursue new things inside the next 90 days? Right, because I have them watch some, some preemptive videos before the interview where they understand our corporate culture, where they understand where we've been, right? We've got some B-roll footage. We've got me being interviewed, a couple different pieces and parts. They can really get a feel for this is who we are and how we run. Is that exciting to you or is that something you want out of? And I'll tell you, Ryan, those things during that due diligence cycle, and of course, right, there, I have a checklist with 165 things I look for, and we don't certainly don't have the time, and, and it'd be drudgery for you to listen to that, but I'll also provide that checklist as well if you're interested. I'll add that to, to the scripts and everything else that are going on as a way to, to just you know, know what to look for in, in, in a perfect situation during a due diligence cycle. I love that. So, so going through um, the, the due diligence cycle and just interviewing people, um, understanding their EQ, their IQ. So you're also, you're looking at the people, you're looking at the process. You mentioned SOPs for those of you that don't know, that's standard operating procedures, just having that well-documented process. Uh, big, 
big proponent myself of people process and technology and where all three of those uh, intersect, uh, you can unlock or reveal any problems and value. And so you can see that Ryan very much focuses on those similar attributes. You didn't use those words. I certainly did. But focusing on people, process, technology, and really understanding, uh, taking a peek under the hood. But you'll never get there until you're, you know how to make a unsolicited offer and turn someone into a seller who was not even thinking about selling. And so a lot of those skills. Now I'm going to push you for maybe one more tip. Let's see if I can get three out of Ryan. So <sighs> based on that, you got me curious. You've been very generous. Um, so we talked about making an unsolicited offer that gets you to the table. Then when you're at the table, you talk about, here's how I go about doing my due diligence with the owner. And then once it's further along, here's how I actually talk to the people that report to that owner and really, uh, wrap my arms around the deal. Now, finally, I just, we got to put a bow on this thing. Once you've done all that work, I'm just wondering your integration process I'm wondering if maybe you can speak to some of those things that you look for as far as integrating. You've talked to the seller, you've motivated the seller, you've talked to the employees, you understand the SOPs, you're here, you're almost there to the finish line. Now we got to integrate this thing into your existing organization. What is, maybe you can talk on some of those key elements that you find when working on integration in companies you're acquiring. Yeah, I, I would love to, Ryan. And it's, it's, the, it's the acknowledgement as we jump into this part of the conversation that the deal's not done, right? The LOI is signed, so everybody's happy in that moment. But on my side as a buyer, the, the work's really just begun, right? The due diligence cycle is, is it's tremendous amount of lift because I'm I'm now switching from I got to sell the person on why they need to sell it to holy cow, now I need to find every reason why I don't need to buy this thing, right? And it's a whole different mindset. But once you get to the, that finish line of due diligence and and you recommit and you re to, re-agree to Whatever the new deal structure looks like, whether it's new, enhanced, altered, maybe it's the same. But now, now there is that final component, which is integration. And the deal's the deal's really not done. Here to me is where you either get a lot of instant value creation or you start really questioning why did you just put that cash out on the table? Because it all starts with that that first moment. I like to I like to treat this like a mortgage. I think most people have bought a home before or went through it at, at one point or another, where you sit there with the buyer and the seller and there's an escrow account. Right. So, well, certainly it, you, you see the, the television shows where you're in the conference room and there's a big check on the table and everybody's celebrating. I don't like to buy deals that way. I like to use a third party escrow company, push funds into escrow and simultaneously require that the seller puts all vital information in that same escrow account. Right. The passwords, bank account access. Right. Anything that is a, a failure point instantaneously, I'm asking to be held in that escrow account. And I'm doing that because. Not because I think the seller is nefarious, right? I, I, don't, I inherently think that people are, are great. I don't think anyone has ill intent. But we forget. And imagine, if you will, as, as you're listening to Ryan and I, you've worked the past 10 years of your life to grow this business. Someone offers you life-changing amounts of cash. Like your, your life has changed forever. And you get the check and you take it to the bank and it cashes. How motivated are you to reach back out and have conversations with the person that just bought it versus go spend time in Tahiti on the beach drinking Mai Tais, right? It, it's a lot more the latter than the former. So you protect this during this on-ramp, right? During this integration process. And so we're locking down. We're making sure that escrow account passes that information back and forth. And then I'm using instantly the, the merger of people, right? Because I love what you said about people, process, and technology because you, you've now given me a, a tool myself. So thank you for that, that incredible play on, not even play on words, just what it really is, right? Because now I need to lock down the people because the people are really what are going to make this so special. The processes, especially when it's a, a, a synergistic acquisition, I'm really pretty good on the processes. I'm buying market share. So the processes, I'm integrating so many of them into my system anyways, but the people can cause a lot of chaos. So we sit down with them, their direct reports, or, or maybe they are a direct report. And we walk them through our system, which is the OKR system, right? Objectives and key results. Really, you know, piloted forward with, um, you know, the, the team at Intel originally, Andy Grove, and then progressed through. It's one of the things that made Google as successful as Google has been is they, they really focus on those OKR systems. And so quite often the, the acquired don't understand what OKRs are. They don't understand how to run that system. They've never been through it before. So not only do they have a new boss or new leader to answer to, now they have new terminologies. And so I said, gosh, it's a lot to remember. So I went to market and found technology to help support it. And that technology is a platform called Lattice. Again, don't own Lattice, didn't invest in Lattice, didn't create Lattice. I wish I did. But what Lattice ends up doing 
it's a software platform that allows for completely eyes wide open integration to a business where you can see the company OKRs, you can see the entire org chart, you can see how everybody's pacing towards their objectives and key results. You can see the, the celebratory wins that are on the, the company wall there. It's a great cultural adherence tool where all of a sudden these people that are now outsiders, it's how quickly can you make them feel like they're part of the family? Because to me, I, don't, I, I really hate the term, you know, give somebody enough rope to hang themselves. If I was going to do that as an acquirer, I might as well just kick you out before you even start. I, I need you to be successful as we integrate. And Lattice has been an incredible tool to help support that across the board. But there's also this other mindset that goes into the, the integration process, right? And that's, that's the fact of I have to assume with a level of certainty, I have missed something in due diligence. And it doesn't matter if I have 12 lawyers looking at it, six of the best accountants and forensic accountants. It doesn't matter the FP&A specialist did the modeling. It doesn't matter all the stuff that I do in the due diligence cycle. There's something that we overlooked, right? And I think that's just the nature of it. So I have to walk into those first 90 days really sussing out, like pushing out into the open. What are the things I might have missed? What's that? What's that red heron that's over in the corner that that I just completely look past because I got caught up in, in that deal heat of, man, I'm so close to the finish line. I don't really care about these last six things that I should look at. It's, it's trading myself and the team that supports me to say, hey, look, you, you really have to focus on what did we miss? And instead of then pushing it to the side, it's bringing it out into the light right away, right? Because if we acknowledge the fact that we might have missed something, then why would we shy away from it? The goal is to then rectify it as quickly as possible. And the rectification typically ends up being pretty simple, right? Because you have the the, the team around you that probably created the issue to start with, plus the, the brain power of the team that they're integrated with. It allows for, for pretty easy, easy integration. And then what I found is, Ryan, you make that 90-day part, and right, we can talk a whole nother conversation around behavioral psychology, right? At the end of the day, if you can get somebody integrated in the first 60 to 70 days, they kind of feel like it's always been home for them. It's, I'm not worried about losing people anymore. Man, well, that is phenomenal. So we walked through, uh, you walked us through your whole system, man. This is awesome. So uh, how to you, you've taken us from how to make a solicited, unsolicited offer to your due diligence, and then obviously integrating once the deal is done and continue to move forward through the first 90 days or so. So that is how Ryan uh, Nidell, uh, this is how you have scaled it. But I'm curious, who, in your opinion, is nailing it? Where is a company that you deeply admire if you could invest or maybe you have invested? Obviously, tell us either way. But um, where is there a company that you feel like is just nailing it in their industry that you absolutely admire for whatever reason? So I, I get to call these people friends, right? This company friends. So I have to acknowledge that I wish I would have been around or friends with them when they started the company because I would have I would have fought tooth and nail to be a part of it. But I'm not a part of it at all. I'm a big fan from the sidelines, and that's a company called First Form, the number one ST, then P-H-O-R-M. And First Form is a company owned by a handful of gentlemen. The, the one that's most notable in the marketplace is a guy named Andy Frisella, has a podcast, Real AF, right? used to be the MF CEO. He's got a couple other partners in the business, his partner Chris, his brother Sal, um, a media buying component named Jason. And together, they built this, this incredible supplement company that is really, I mean, it, it's a commodity, right? You can buy protein powder and amino acids almost anywhere. And of course, they make incredibly high caliber, high quality products, only the best. But at some point, that's even marginalized, right? I mean, the best is the best is the best everywhere. But what they've done is they've created a culture that that literally thrives around excellence. And from having the opportunity to spend more than a handful of days at their facility they built two years ago, you walk in and it's like, it's like they were expecting the president of the United States and it, it's clean. It's spotless. Every person you pass says, hello, how are you today? You walk in to use the restroom and it is immaculate. The best part is they don't have a cleaning staff, Ryan. They don't employ cleaners. They don't bring in outside people. It's a self-governing, self-regulating environment because of the culture they've built of, of people holding other people accountable. And that transitions all the way, Ryan, into little things. Like if you were to order from First Form right now, you're going to get a handwritten note in your order 
that addresses something about your life, right? They're going to physically look online. They're going to spend the time to get to know you, and they're going to welcome you to what they refer to as the family, P-H-A-M-I-L-Y. And so they've created this play on words and this, this cultural adherence that I'll tell you, if, if more companies to me focused on making people feel included, making them feel part of a culture and, and really focused on doing the right thing by customers every time. And how different would the world be? It's something that I aspire to, to adhere to inside of MIT 45. I'd do anything I could to, to probably even be, Ryan, 80% as good as they are. And they would say they're not half as good as they're capable of being. Wow, phenomenal. So, you know, the, you, you reminded me. So first form, that reminds me of a, of a saying uh, from one of the, the great former CEOs, uh, Peter Drucker, who says uh, that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And so when you have that culture that you're talking about, and thank you for illustrating, now I'm, I'm totally going to go look him up. I know who Andy Frisell is, but I, I want to learn more about his company. I'm a big culture guy myself. I really appreciate those people that really, those operators that really took it. It's beyond just producing a product and selling it. And yeah, you got to do that. But they take it one step further, their commitment to excellence. And they say, but how we produce, how we deliver, how we operate in the market matters. Those people, just like you, man, a lot of respect. Like those people that really focus on how we show up and how we operate does matter. Not only what we do, but how we do it. I absolutely love it. So as as we wrap things up, uh, any other final things uh, that you want our listeners around the world to know? Right. If, there, if there's one thing I've been I've been sharing this as I've been fortunate to be a guest on a few other shows. The, the part that I'd ask you to, to consider as you're as you're spending time with Ryan and I is that all these things that we discuss really tie into a belief system, right? And, and it. When you believe you're capable of doing something, you hold that belief with, with such a firm grip that it's not shakable. Everything else ends up falling in place right behind that. And so it's this, this, this thought process around whether it's business, whether it's your personal life, whether it's you know mergers and acquisitions or, or exiting your company. You're capable of far more than you give yourself credit for. And if you just have one person that can hold that belief for you, you're capable of, of, of true magnificence across the board. Man, that is phenomenal. So from listening as we wrap things up, just to conclude, um, following Ryan's advice, learn how to approach sellers. Find the script, get a system. Ryan's generously said, look, I'll just give you all the stuff that I do absolutely for free. Um, And then also pay attention to your due diligence. This is an important phase when acquiring companies or even selling companies, really understanding what is it you're about to jump in or jump out of. And then focus on integration uh, that Ryan really alluded to on doing interviews and really doing everything that you can. And we kind of summarize, put a bow on that around people, process and technology. But, you know, that's not exhaustive. There could be other things. Um, but really understand um, w- how things will integrate and pay deep attention. And then finally, um, talking about first form, learn to build a culture that is viral, that, you know, if, if really wrap your arms around your client, your customers, if they're not there, we're not there. And so creating those things and having those skills are all critical skills we need in our pursuit of making billions.